Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. This is one of those really, really important topics, and I'm so glad that the Atlanta Black Chamber is able to bring this to you today. Uh, for those who don't know, my name is Melvin Coleman. I'm the president and CEO of the ABC. And so our Financial Services Committee, as many of you know, we have several committees uh, that make up the structure of our organization and, and how we operate. Uh, but our fin Financial Services Committee in particular is charged with uh, financial literacy, financial education, uh, empowering our community with information uh, that is going to impact our lives because of the, de the decisions we make, making informed decisions. So, so that's why this sort of thing is important. And then when you show up, that's confirmation that you realize, hey, this is what I need uh, to do better, not just for myself, but my family, my community. So without any further delay from me, uh, we are delighted uh, to have a special guest presenter. Um, you know, I checked the brother's credentials and everything. He is he's a superstar uh, in, in, in his space. OK, so. Uh, for him to come through today for the ABC, you know, we, we're, we're really grateful. So please uh, tune in, pay attention, take notes. Um, you know, this is one of those opportunities uh, for us to go to another level. And so having said all of that, let me make sure that, that he'll be able to uh, share his screen because he has a presentation. But uh, Mr. Matthew, hey, brother, we want to give you the floor so you can introduce yourself and share whatever tidbits you want to let the folks know um, about yourself. But um, I believe you can share screen also as, in terms of bringing up that presentation. But uh, it is time to get down to business, everybody. Okay, let's see if this works. <laughs> okay. Uh, okay. Um. Let's see here. Mm. I see a button up here that says share. That is correct. And so if you have your presentation on screen in terms of your computer and you hit share, share screen and and do you see what do you see on your on your on your side? Oh, I see it now. Okay, there we go. Let's see here. All right, can we see that? Yes. And so now, if you would, um, you know, go to your slideshow where you bring it into presentation mode from your PowerPoint, uh, which is down at the bottom, uh, that little icon for slideshow down at the bottom. Oh, yeah. so the bottom uh, left, I'm sorry, bottom right. <laughs> the bar, So over, yep, towards the bottom. And there's an icon that will bring it into presentation mode. Uh, slideshow. Uh, yep, you were just, you were just there. Hey, okay. Let me see. Now for, is that it? Let's yeah. see. Yeah, so the view that I have is of the, of the presentation. And okay. I think I'm getting confirmation that yeah they they see the the presentation. Now my view is also showing me this other part, but I don't know that that's going to interfere with anything. Yeah, so so let's get down to business, man. Um, glad we were able to get through that that part of it. <laughs> you know, we we do Zoom all the time, and 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 so you know, not, not everybody lives in the Zoom world uh, like we do. But I, I think overall, you 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 did good, man. <laughs> yeah, I'm 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 a, I'm a quick study. <laughs> okay, okay, hey man, hey man, hey, look, the floor is yours. Um, these folks showed up for you, and uh, it's, it's not looking bad. I mean, we're just getting started, man, and you know, probably already, yeah, past 30, 30 attendees, so not bad. Okay. Great, great. So I'm just gonna I'm gonna start out with my name and my credentials. Um, and what I'm going to ask everyone to do is hold all of your questions 
until the end of the presentation. There's a lot of material that we have to cover. Um, this is a very in-depth subject. Um, it's not talked about much, especially in the Black community. So I'm very privileged to bring this before you all. So let's, let's dig in. My name is Matthew Jennings, and as you can see, I've listed my credentials here, JD in law, MBA in finance, BS in management systems. I'm an IRS enrolled agent, which is the highest designation that you can get in tax. In the world of tax, you have basically three credentialed persons who can represent people before the IRS, and that is the CPA, Certified Public Accountant, the tax attorney, and the IRS enrolled agent. I have the highest designation. The CPA and the tax attorney are state licensed. The IRS enrolled agent is a federal license that's issued by the Department of Treasury. And as you know, the Department of Treasury, the IRS is a division of the Department of Treasury. And the Department of Treasury is responsible for collecting tax revenues. There's two ways that you become an IRS enrolled agent. You either have to have worked for the IRS for five years or you have to pass their exams. I passed their exams and they're, I must tell you that they're extremely difficult. I'm also a registered financial consultant, a certified estate planner, certified trust specialist, a certified researcher, and a U.S. Marine Corps Gulf War veteran. Ooh, raw. Mm -hmm. No doubt. Today, we're gonna to talk about a very special type of trust. Not all trusts are the same. Most people are familiar with what is called a living trust, a living trust. 50% of the people that are 50 years or older have a living trust. A living trust is a revocable trust. It is a uh, revocable trust, it is a grantor trust, which basically means that the grantor gives his assets to the trust. There is no real separation between the living trust and the grantor. So there is no real tax advantages and there's no real asset protection. The only thing that the living trust does in the tax world is it helps you to avoid estate tax. And many of you will not be subject to estate tax unless you have an estate over 12 million. So if you don't have an estate over 12 million, you're not gonna be subject to estate tax. So the living trust would not help you from a, a tax standpoint. And for asset protection, there's no distinguished um, separation between you and the trust. So if you were ever sued, your assets would be subject to um, your assets in the trust will be subject to attachment. But a living trust does one very good thing. It avoids probate. And I know that we all have heard of probate. Probate is the process of determining who gets your assets once you are deceased. Every state has a probate um, and every state is different. If you have multiple properties in multiple states, you're gonna have multiple probates. Probate is bad because you have two attorneys billing at the same time. You have court costs, it's public. So everybody gets to see the information. Um, a lot of probate attorneys can get up, up to 5% of the state. And it, it's up to them, you know, it's to their advantage to keep, you know, keep things going and keep, you know, the, the litigation going so they can milk the state. So probate is bad. Another bad thing about probate is that if you have a will, the judge doesn't necessarily have to abide by the will. The will can be challenged. It can be challenged by anybody. Somebody can just come out the woodwork and say, hey, I'm your long lost child. I get it. You know, I deserve a piece of that. And they start some litigation. And there you have it. Um, there's a lot of famous people that you know of that died with wills or didn't die without a, you know, die without a will like Prince. Uh, you, you have a lot of lot of people, and you may have heard of, um, you know, states like Elvis Presley. Elvis Presley's estate was in probate for a couple decades, so these things could go on forever. So you want to avoid probate at all costs, you know. So having a will 
with something of the past, the thing to have nowadays is to have a trust. Do not die without one. The type of trust that we're going to talk about today, like I said, there's different types of trust. There are many different types of trust. You have blind trust. You have land trust. You have gun trust. You have social, social security trust. You have nimcrats and clats and cruts and nimcrats and digits and idgits. And you have, I mean, there's just so many types, special needs trusts. I can go on and on about the number of trusts and the types of trusts that are out there. There are literally hundreds hundreds and hundreds of different types of trust. But what is a trust? A trust is simply a contract. It's a contract. It's formed by contract. It is considered a separate entity if you have a non-grantor trust, unlike the living trust. A non-grantor trust is considered a separate entity. It gets its own tax ID number. And that's really what you want to have. The particular trust we're going to be speaking of today is a non-grantor irrevocable, discretionary, dual track, spendthrift trust. And it has both asset protection and tax savings. And we're going to get into that as we um, proceed. Nelson Rockefeller taught us the secret to success is to own nothing but control everything. You don't want to own anything because with ownership comes liability and comes litigation. No one is going to pursue a lawsuit with you if there's nothing to get. Last year, I stopped probably five lawsuits um, from different states, a couple in uh, California, one in New York, I think there was one in Kansas, a um, couple in Florida. Um, but I love this stuff. I, I love, I love um, you know, I love telling the judges to take a hike. Um, because this tr particular trust, you cannot subpoena the records, you cannot dispose, uh, there's no de de depositions, you know, we don't answer interrogatories, we just make the lawsuit go away. And I'm not promising you that you're not going to get sued. All of you will be sued four times in your lifetime. Four times in your lifetime, you will be sued. It's just a matter of time, especially people that have businesses, people that have wealth, you are going to get sued. So just be prepared for it. Um, it's better to plan for it than to, to be, you know, reactive. But you want to control everything. You don't want to own anything. You don't want anything in your name. You want to be able to control it. What's the difference between you owning a car and you being able to drive that, not owning a car and being able to drive that car whenever you want to? If you can drive that car whenever you want to and you have access to that car whenever you want to, why do you need to own it? You don't. Definition of a trust. Again, it is a contract. You have the unrestricted constitutional right to contract. And that contract governs its own operations doesn't answer to anybody this is a beautiful thing you know we, we kind of wonder where privacy went. you know prior privacy went out the door but when you establish a trust you get some of that privacy back because people can see the trust but they cannot look underneath the hood they cannot determine or identify everything that's in that particular trust because it doesn't register in any state and it doesn't answer to any state or any county or any city. Again, we talked about lawsuits and about being sued. You will be sued. A divorce is a lawsuit too, the last time I checked. Um, this trust is the best prenup and the best postnup that you can get. And as you know, prenups and postnups can be challenged. They can be challenged. Um, there's many ways to, to break up a prenup and a postnup, and, and the other person will end up getting more than you desire. But a trust isn't subject to the, that. It's not subject to debate. You know, the only persons in the trust that can 
can litigate within the trust are the members of that contract, the grantor, settlor, the beneficiaries, the trustee. And sometimes that person, sometimes those people are the same person. No one's going to sue themselves. So the trust is a very solid instrument. This trust is a very solid instrument against lawsuits. This is what happens. All of, all, of, all of you out there who have your partnerships and you have your LLCs, you have your corporations, and you think you have, you know, some asset protection. You may be protected from the business debts, but if you don't cross all of your T's and dot all of your I's and you don't follow those corporate formalities, every state has corporate formalities. When you ask permission to form an LLC, or you ask permission to form a corporation, you are agreeing to abide by those corporate formalities. What are corporate formalities? Corporate formalities are things such as no commingle. You know, we've all done it. We've all commingled personal money with business money. How about filing your, you know, filing your paperwork like your, your state? filings, you file your state filings late, or you forget to have a resolution for something, or you forget your minutes, or you forget, you know, all those other corporate documents, or maybe you're running a loss for your business for more than three to five years, and you're running basically a hobby business. It is so easy to pierce the corporate veil and set aside your LLC and set aside your corporation under the alter, alter ego concept. It's done all of the time. So you don't have the protection that you think you have. There's no business that I've ever consulted where I was not able to find something where I could pierce the corporate veil. And I've done hundreds and hundreds of consultations throughout the country on various different types of businesses. It's so easy to fail in this area. However, with the trust, a trust is not subject to those state statutes. They're not subject to any types of piercing because it does not answer to the state. It is a contract. It just answers to the individuals that are parties to that contract. And as you can see, some of these lawsuits are ridiculous. Dog bite, 6.9 million, car accident, 49 million. This will wipe most of us out. If these judgments came through and they were able to collect, they will wipe most of us out. So we have to, we have to be proactive and we have to do something about this. It's the ultimate asset protection. It's not subject to tax liens, levies, divorce, alimony, child support, third party, you know, governmental agencies, you know, the SEC, Federal Trade Commission. All those guys, IRS, all of those guys, it's not subject to turnover orders, which means no court can say, hey, trustee, turn over those assets to satisfy this judgment. Typically, when my clients notify me of a lawsuit in the very beginning stages, I write a letter. One letter, maybe two, and that lawsuit goes away. I basically tell them to kick rocks. You cannot subpoena any of the documents in the trust. You can't force uh, any disclosure of the trust document. Um, you cannot attach the assets in the trust because of the spendthrift provision. I get a kick out of that too. I get so much fun telling them to go sit on a nail. All right. A lot of times I, I, I get into discussions um, uh, with different attorneys, different CPAs, and we have our differing opinions about, you know, taking a, a certain tax uh, opinion and, you know, being, you know, aggressive when it comes to taxes. Um, we've had maybe one or two um, audits on these particular trusts. And these particular trusts would come out squeaky clean on the audit. And 
through my research, when the IRS closes an audit, they take a certain position. They basically agree with that position and you basically can use that if you're ever challenged um, by the IRS on, the, on, on this particular trust. You can challenge that. You can say, hey, this is, this is a situation where you, where you did an audit on this particular type of trust. You found you know, everything to be in order. So that's your, your free get out of tax card. Also, when you take a certain position on a tax return, when you take a position, when you are aggressive uh, with your tax return, that does not subject you to jail. You do not go to jail because you took a tax position. The worst thing that can happen when you take a tax position and that tax position is not correct the very worst, the, the worst thing that can happen is that you simply would pay the tax that you would be normally paying anyway. But you don't go to jail for be, you don't go to jail because you have a different opinion than IRS regarding a tax matter. You go to jail for tax evasion and you go to jail for tax fraud. Tax evasion is when you hide things, you hide income. Tax fraud is when you lie, you cheat on your tax return. Those are the things that will send you to jail. As long as you don't do those two things, you will only simply owe the tax. Now, there's something about owing tax. The IRS is not interested in how much you owe. They're interested in how much you can pay. If you owe, for example, $100,000, you can only pay $20,000 and that can be proven, then the IRS will accept the $20,000. They'll settle for $20,000. I had a guy that owed $119,000, actually $130,000, $130,000. I settled it for $900. Bucks, $900. So, that's just one example of one of the many, many cases that I saw where people owed a lot of money in tax and they could not pay. So don't ever let anybody fool you that the IRS is just, you know, if you if you sit there and do nothing, you know, they'll come hard at you. But if you have someone like me in your corner fighting for you, I can get you a really good settlement because again, the IRS is only interested in how much. You can pay and not how much you owe. Remember earlier, we we're talking about all of the different types of trust. You know, all of all of your leaders, your presidents, your senators, your house of representatives. The tax law was made by them for them. Just about every senator, every U.S. House of Representatives, every president. You know, most of those guys have law degrees. They were once attorneys. Our government is made up of a bunch of attorneys. And the Congress is responsible for drafting the tax legislation. They're responsible for that. And every time Congress meets the tax, the tax laws change. But the tax laws are written for them by them. It's written buy them for them. And most of these guys, they have trust. They have trust, they have businesses, you know, their families are wealthy and the tax laws are always gonna have hidden gems for wealthy people, for business owners. The tax code is not written for the W-2 employee. If you're gonna, be a W-2 employee all your life, you will never get tax breaks. The only tax, the only time you get a tax break as a W-2 employee is if you're making under $30,000, you're going to get the earned income credit. You're going to get all of your, your money back, plus you're going to get a subsidy from the government. That's what you're going to get if you're, you know, making $30,000 or less. But if you are fortunate to be among those of us who make at least a half a million dollars or more, you're gonna be taxed at the highest tax rates unless you do something. 
unless you do something about it and you can do something about it. But we'll get to that a little bit later on. But these just, a, you know, these are the types of trust that these guys have. Dynasty trusts in 1936. That trust is almost, they have several trusts, by the way. But those trusts are almost 100 years old. Can you imagine paying almost no tax for 100 years? You know, you and your children's 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 children, you know, benefit from that. I mean, and we can even discuss, you know, let's discuss the Rockefellers. You know, Standard Oil of 1836. Um, I mean, 1863. 1863 Standard Oil was a business trust. You know, uh, LLCs and corporations and all those didn't come into existence until the, the early to mid 1900s. Before then, from the from the you know from the biblical times, people have been operating in trust. And when this country was established, people were operating in trust. They were doing business in trust. So these families have been operating in trust for hundreds of years, and they have hundreds of millions, tens of billions of dollars. You know, you know, tens of millions, hundreds of millions, tens of billions of dollars in these different trusts that they have. But these are just some of the types of trusts. You know, Joseph Kennedy has a dynasty trust. Mitt Romney has the intentionally defective grantor trust. Donald Trump has blind trust. Um, and everybody knows that, you know, the Trump Hotel, uh, you slip, you, you go into the Trump Hotel and you slip on the floor. You cannot sue Donald Trump, even though you know he has something to do with that hotel. It bears his name, but it's not in his name. He's controlling it, but he doesn't own it. You can slip and fall if you want to. You cannot sue Trump and get any money. You can sue him, but you won't get any money. You might get, you know, insurance. You know, you get the insurance proceeds from any of the insurance policies. But to penetrate and get to his assets, that will not happen. That will never happen. I hear this all the time. This is too good to be true. Why isn't everybody doing it? Blah, 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 blah. You know, we need to read people. Sometimes we just need to, we need to read. We need to do research. This sort of thing is in the news all of the time about, you know, rich people, you know, these corporations paying zero in taxes on billions in profit. They pay zero in taxes. As a matter of fact, a lot of these companies get a refund. They get a refund. And guess where that refund is coming from? That refund is coming from the U.S. Treasury. And where is that money coming from? Out of, the, out of your pocket. Every time you pay your tax bill, it's like taking Jeff Bezos to lunch and you're picking up the tab. That's basically what you're doing. These companies get refunds. Your money is being redistributed. Every time you lift a finger and you pay those tax dollars, they're being redistributed to the rich and the rich are only getting richer. We think that our money is going to pay for, you know, health care and public services and all of that. We owe trillions and trillions of dollars in debt. The U.S. Treasury raises three to four trillion a year. Most of that money goes back to refunds. It does not go to the debt of the nation. That's why we keep printing money. You know, you think you are being patriotic by paying 50% in tax, you know, 37% at the federal level, 13% if you're in California, 11% if you're in New York, you know, you're paying almost half of your income in taxes and you think that's being patriotic. I beg to differ. Actually being patriotic, you know, this country was formed on not paying taxes, actually. You know, Boston Tea Party and all of those revolutions that we have, we didn't want taxation without representation, uh, representation and that's basically what we have today. We don't have representation. You know, um, the, the direction in which our country is headed, the direction in which our country is headed is not representative of our views and what we want. I guess, we, I think we can all agree to that. So we basically don't have the representation but we're paying the taxes for that representation. These, these lawmakers, they do what they wanna do. They're attorneys, they know how to work in the system. 
you know, most of them get into politics to become rich. You know, that's part of it. But you need to you need to take a different thought process. You need to think of think about taxes and view taxes in a different light. And, you know, again, these guys, they have trust. They don't pay, you know, that much in tax. And they have these companies and these companies, you know, they they work the tax code. You know, there's only one tax code. There's not three or four different tax codes. There's not a tax code for the rich and one for the, you know, for the poor, one for whites, one for blacks. There's one tax code. And there are golden nuggets in the tax code. And if your tax professionals are bright enough, if they are curious enough, um, if they're hungry enough, that they, they will find those go, golden nuggets to, to better assist their clients. I mean, you can do a lot more good with more money in your pocket. I mean, sometimes, sometimes paying your taxes is the difference between sending your kids to, you know, to Berkeley or Harvard or Yale versus, you know, sending them to a community college because you can't afford to send them because you're paying 30, 40, 50% in tax. You know, you can do, you guys can do a lot better with your own money. I'm just a, a huge proponent of that concept. There are ways to legally reduce your taxes. It's not a myth. We just we just saw the article um, about Amazon. I mean, it was a few years ago, but <laughs> those a lot of those Internal Revenue Code sections still exist. They do a lot of um, they do a lot of international transfers to keep their monies, you know, to keep their profits offshore. That's one of the reasons why they're reducing their taxes. But that's just one of one of several different tax strategies that are available in the code. But we utilize a one of a kind uh, Spencer Trust. Um, this trust is written, written specifically to defer taxes, to avoid taxes. It's specifically written for that purpose. It's specifically written to have asset protection. So you'll pay minimal taxes, with you know income that flows through this trust, there's zero gray area. You don't pay any taxes on capital gains. You know, and that's and capital gains is is basically when you sell something, any income producing asset. You sell real estate. You sell you know cryptocurrency, um, uh, intellectual property. I mean, you have a lot of uh, entertainers that have royalties. If their royalties um, you know, if the royalties are assigned to the trust, they don't pay taxes on royalties. I mean, people literally can save hundreds of thousands of dollars, if not millions. Last year, I saved a guy 23 million, 23 million uh, on a hundred million dollar tax sale. So, you know, those savings can add up. Just imagine what he can do with that $23 million, you know. Full transparency. This trust is what I call the whole truth and nothing but the truth, so help you God trust. Because you don't have to cheat. You don't have to hide anything. You show all of the income. You show all of the income. And we'll get to an example tax return here in a minute. But you show all of the income. So if you're showing all of the income, how can you be? tax evading or you know defrauding you can't you can't do any of those things if you're showing everything if you're showing everything and the IRS doesn't dispute that return you are good to go you have 3 to 6 years the IRS has 3 to 6 years to dispute that return and if they don't dispute that return guess what you're good to go but i'm going to let you in on another secret there is no audit program for trust returns. There's no audit program for it, people. Which means unless the return is just completely just bogus, it's going to go right through with flying colors. It's never going to be snagged. That's a beautiful thing. And it's on purpose. Why do you think there's no audit program for trust returns? Why do you think that? 
because most of the rich people have these trusts. They have trust. You know, the, the one percenters and the two percenters have trust. You know, out of the 200 million, 200 million tax returns that are filed every year, there's only three million returns that are trust returns. Three million trust returns out of 200 million returns. Why would they have an audit program for such a small minority? It's on purpose, people. It's on purpose. For them, by them. Amazing. Tax evasion is illegal. Intentional omissions and proper deductions, false allocations of proper credits or exemptions, concealment of assets. When you have this particular trust, I just told you, it's to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. So help you God trust. You show everything. So there's no intentional omissions. You don't have to deduct anything because there's no taxes. Deductions lower taxable liability. But if you don't have any tax liability, there's no need for deductions, even though you can take deductions because one day the trust will end and pay taxes. Maybe. Maybe not. If you keep the trust going forever, then that day will never happen. So if that day never happens, you will have legally avoided the tax altogether. That is the whole goal of everything. You want to keep the trust going until all of the money is expensed out. And if all of the money is expensed out, then there's zero dollars left to pay taxes on. And taxes on zero is what? Zero. So look, there's no false allocations. There's no credits or exemptions, no concealment of assets. You show everything on the trust tax return, everything. Tax avoidance, that's what we do. Tax avoidance is legal. Any attempt to reduce, minimize, or alleviate taxes by legitimate means is permissible. You know, that's what's patriotic. It's patriotic of you to take care of your family. It's patriotic of you to leave something to your heirs. The Bible says a good man leaves an inheritance to his children and his children's children. How can you do that if you're paying 50% in tax? How can you do that if you're paying estate tax? How can you do that if you're paying gift tax? How can you do that if you're paying generation skipping transfer tax? The gift tax and the state tax is 40%. The generation skipping transfer tax is 80%. It can be up to 80%. 80%. That should be a crime for the government to take 80, 80% of your income. That should be an outright crime. You know, I, I don't think I, people, I don't really think we realize just how much you know, taxes affect us. It, 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 it touches everything. You get taxed when you make the money. Then that same money that you got taxed on, when you go to spend it, you get taxed again, sales tax. Then when you go to sell something, you get taxed again, capital gains tax. And they won't even let you die in peace because they hit you with the biggest taxes of them all, state tax and generation skipping transfer tax, again, which could take 40 to 80% of your estate. You have we have to do better. And I think that when we know better, we can do better. And this is why it's so important for, you know, for us to have education about taxes, because taxes touch everything. We have all of these people that claim to be, you know, financial consultants and they're finance experts and they, you know, they, you know, financially free. No, no. You are not financially free until you learn how to deal with taxes. You cannot be. You will be a slave to tax debt until you learn how to avoid it. Now, some taxes is okay. I'm probably at a 3% effective tax rate, 3% on seven figures. I should be 50%, but I'm at 3% because I'm utilizing the tax code, you know as much as possible. OK, 
History of our trust format. The 643 Trust has been around for over 60 years. We have our own format that we copyrighted in 2019. And, you know, copyright is no big deal. It's just, you know, you know, people can't, you know, you know, copy it, but there's so many ways to write a 643 trust. You know, it doesn't, you know, it just protects us, you know, but it doesn't, that's all it really does. So the copyright is not really a big thing. But these trusts have been, they've been around for a long time. Um they were designed by legal and tax professionals because there's so many disciplines that come into play when you are, you know, you know, when you're designing a trust. A trust is a contract. So you got to know a lot about trust. You know, the trust is a trust. So you got to know about trust law. You know, you're dealing with taxes. So you got to know about taxes. Um, and there's just, you know, it's business. You got to know about business. There's so many disciplines that come into being when you form this trust. And this is why, you know, I represent, you know, these trusts and I market these trusts because I have all these disciplines. I have an MBA in finance. That's my business background. You know, I have a law degree. So I got, you know, the contract law. I'm a trust specialist, board certified trust specialist. So I know the trust law of it. So there's all of these disciplines that I have make me, you know, you know, the appropriate, you know, person with the appropriate credentials to, to market this trust and to help people, you know, uh, avoid taxes in this manner. But the, the four bodies of laws that basically make up this trust are the Internal Revenue Code, the Uniform Trust Code, the Third Restatement of Trust, and Scott's Own Trust Law. So you got to be familiar with all of these bodies of laws in order to be able to basically draft, you know, a trust of this nature, because it has to have all of those ingredients that we mentioned before. It has to have all of those prov provisions. It has to be non-grantor. It cannot be grantor, because if it's grantor, you won't have the asset protection. It has to be, you know, it has to be irrevocable. Irrevocable doesn't mean that there can't be changes Irrevocable just means that the trust document can't be changed, but you can make changes. You can add and remove beneficiaries. You can add and remove property. You can add and remove trustees. So you can make all of the changes that you need to make without actually changing the, the document. It has to be discretionary. The reason why it has to be discretionary is because you have to have discretionary power over the distribution. Without the discretionary power over the distribution, the trust would not have the tax advantages. It has to be, it has to be dual track. It has to have the ability to um, not give a distribution. It has to have the ability to give a distribution. It has to be spendthrift so it can protect, you know, from attachment, third party attachment. So it has to have all of these different provisions in order for it to work. Again, it complies with Scotland Trust Law, the Uniform Trust Code. Statement third of trust and internal revenue code. So that's a lot of knowledge to have to deal with in order to be able to draft these trusts. And they're valid in all 50 states. Some states are better than others. You typically want to form a trust in a state that has no tax because states sometimes are more difficult to deal with than the IRS, especially California and New York. What makes our trust unique? Again, it's not because it's a copyright because, you know, again, copyrights only protect us. And again, you know, if, if someone wanted to draft a trust like this, they could if they know all of those four bodies of law uh, and they have all the credentials, they could do it. But what makes this trust unique is that it is irrevocable. It is non-grantor. It's dual track. And you would only know that if you're a tax guy. You know, very few people understand what that really means. Um, but again, you don't need to know all of the things that make a car run. You just need to know how to drive the car, right? So we're going to teach you how to drive this car. It's discretionary and it also has a spendthrift provision. You as the client, trustee, you manage the assets, you make all decisions, 
You are the one controlling your assets. No one else is controlling your assets. If we break all of these different terms down and kind of explain to you what they mean, again, irrevocable just means that the trust document can't be changed. But even now in this day and age, they have, every state has what's called decanting rules. These decanting rules allow you to change even an irrevocable trust to make changes. So again, you know, things can be, things can still be changed, but you want it to be irrevocable because irrevocable it limits, you know, the changes, and that's very important when it comes to asset protection. You want it to be non-grantor. Again, remember that term that we used earlier about the alter ego. You know, if it's a non-grantor, it's not considered you. It's not there cannot be any mismanagement because it's not subject to that alter ego concept. Also, when you have a grantor trust, there's no asset protection. No asset protection and no tax advantages. Complex. For the most part, your trust will remain as a complex trust. And basically what that means is as long as your trust remains a complex trust by not giving a distribution, it can accumulate the income and that income is not subject to tax. It's only tax when you give a distribution, which we will show you how to avoid. And it's only tax when the trust ends, which we show you how to keep the trust going. You simply, um, you simply just have successors. So, you know, your son or your daughter, whoever takes over after you, and then their son or daughter takes over after them, then their son or daughter takes over after them, and you just keep it going. That's how the dynasty trust with the Kennedys, it continues to go because every, every um, generation keeps it going. They keep it going. Discretionary is important again for tax. Again, the tax side of this, the tax advantage of this trust. It has to be discretionary, which means the trustee has to have absolute and sole power to determine the distribution. And again, we try to avoid that distribution and all of the assets that are in the trust are not designated to be owned by anybody. And that's really important for the asset protection because when a title was split, no one can attach an asset where the title was split. If John and Gary own a piece of property together, Gary gets sued, they can't take the property because, you know, the other person is on it. The other person gets sued, they can't take it because Gary is on it. So that's why it's important, you know, to have these provisions. And you never you need every single one of these provisions, every single one of these five provisions. And we talked about the spendthrift provision. Again, the spendthrift provision prevents attachment by third parties. Again, when your properties are in this trust. No judge can order a turnover order. They can't, they can't issue a turnover order, you know, to say turnover the assets to in the that they do not belong to you. You just control those assets. Now there is one instance, one exception where they can get to get to the assets of the trust, and that's called fraudulent conveyance or fraudulent transfer. Every state has a fraudulent transfer statute. Some of them are two years, some are four, six, 10 year statutes, um, where if you did something within that time frame to avoid, you know, attachment, then they could they could get as you know um, access to those assets. But again, they would have to they would have to be able to get information on the trust. You know, trust is formed when you thought about it. And who knows what you are thinking? No one knows what you're thinking. You know, and again, they can't subpoena any of the trust document. So they really don't know. So fraudulent transfer will be very, very difficult to prove. Very, very difficult to prove. But that could be potentially and technically the only thing that could um, allow access, access to the um, 
to the uh, assets of the trust. Okay, again, this is how we get money out of the trust. And this is in the trust. This is how we get money out of the trust. Taxable distribution, if you write a check directly to a beneficiary to buy a car, that's a taxable distribution. If the trust purchases the car with the trust funds and just gives the beneficiary the keys to drive the car, then that's not taxable. And so it's just a matter of how you structure, it's just a matter of how you structure your transactions. That's the difference between paying tax and not paying tax. So we're gonna give you an example with the trust and without the trust. So we have a scenario where a person has net income of 1.2 million. They have net income, which means they have revenue. The revenue could be 2 million, 3 million, 4 million, whatever it is, but the bottom line ends, ends up being 1.2 million. Without a trust, you're gonna have taxable income of 1.2 million and you're gonna be paying 37%. Once you get above about 500,000, you hit the 30%, 37% tax rate. So you're looking at $444,000 taxes due on that 1.2 million income. What if we ran that income through the trust? What if the trust was an owner of the business as well? And that net income of 1.2 million went to the trust instead of all going to you. So your business assets lease from, you know, you the, your business leases those assets from the trust for a million dollars. So the trust gets a million dollars, you get 200,000. Now you're paying 20% on 200,000 instead of paying 37% on 1.2 million. So you're paying $40,000 in taxes instead of paying $444,000 in taxes. That's a huge difference, a huge difference. Another example, income with the trust and without the trust. Look at the difference. 88%, almost 89% savings. Here's a trust tax, here's a, here's a trust tax return. Notice all of the different incomes come in on lines one through nine, on lines one through eight, and they totaled on line one through nine. This particular, it's about $146,000. Okay, all of that money is expensed out. $146,000 is expensed out. There's zero in taxes. So this is what happens on the expense side. So let's just say the trust actually has $50,000 in expenses. So if it has $50,000 in expenses, the other $96,000 that's left over is allocated to corpus, and it's considered a distribution expense as well, but it goes over to corpus to be spent in later years. So it zeroes out. Remember how we told you, remember how I told you that this is the um, tell the truth, the whole truth, nothing but the truth to help you guys trust. It is. You're showing all of the income. You're not cheating at all. You're showing every single thing that you do. And on the, on the schedules and on the explanation sheets, you're showing what you're doing and you're showing your logic, you're showing your tax position. It's up to the IRS to now that you, now that you've disclosed your tax position, your explanations, your expenses, your itemizations, your lists, your schedules, it's up to them to say, oh, you know, this is allowed or this isn't allowed. And again, they have, you know, a certain amount of time to do that. Zero. And this shows you how it affects your, your personal return, you know, because you'll still have a personal return. You still have a personal return. You'll have some personal income that you claim. And, you know, you will determine, or we, we together will determine what, the, what that percentage is. It may be, you know, 20% to you, 80% to the trust, 10% to you, 90% to the trust, 
you know, 50% to you, 50% to the trust. It just depends. You're going to have your personal income because there's three categories of things that you cannot write off in the trust. You cannot, you cannot write off food, fun, or fashion. Food, fun, or fashion, three Fs. Those are the things that are always going to be personal that you're going to have to have your own budget for. But if you're claiming 20% of the income and the trust is claiming 80%, 20% of your income for food, fun, and, and fashion is a pretty good budget. Because remember, the trust, all of the assets are in the trust, the homes, the cars, everything. The trust can pay for the utilities. It can pay the mortgages. It can pay the car notes. It can pay the insurances. You know, it can pay the maintenance. It can pay all of those big expenses that you would normally have to pay out of pocket. They'll pay all of those big expenses that you can't personally write off on your return. I mean, you can't write off your car payment on your personal return. You can on the business return if you're using it for business, but that's a deduction. And a deduction is what? A deduction is subject to scrutiny. So why you want to utilize a trust. A business is formed to operate and make a profit. A trust doesn't have that goal. A trust exists to provide benefits. It doesn't exist to make a profit. So the trust is going to have a different set of tax rules versus a business. A business is always going to pay tax on profit because it has a profit motive. A trust does not have a profit motive. A trust can run at a loss for years and it will never have a problem because it's not in the business of earning a profit. This is why it's important to learn the trust game. Again, these are actual returns. You know, you, you can drastically reduce your tax liability by utilizing one of these trusts. Drastically, I mean, drastically. I mean, like night and day difference. And I'm running through these slides relatively quickly because I want to, you know, save some time for questions. Um, just some examples of some of the things that you get to write off in the trust. Contributions, medical bills, woman board at college, wellness, you know, travel, interest on credit cards, telephone, life insurance premiums. You know, bank fees, home expenses, utilities, again, utilities. You can't write your utilities off on your personal return. You can't on a trust return. You can't on a business return if you own the building, but you have to own the building. Postage. I mean, these are just examples. How do you fund your trust? How do you get your money over into the trust? You're going to put income producing assets in the trust. What's an income producing asset? Your business. You can put part of your business in there. Um, you don't have to put all of your business in there. Again, you need to have own some of the business yourself so that you can have income for your personal food, fun, and fashion, right? But the majority of your business income, the majority of your business can be owned by your trust, and the majority of that money can flow through to the trust. And the majority of the taxes that you would normally pay could be deferred indefinitely. But any income producing assets, you know, your business, your, your crypto, your intellectual property, royalties, um, you know, rental real estate, um, all of that. You know, you know, some of the, some authors are. You know, if, you're, if, you're, if your trust owns your book, the trust owns your book, all of those royalties that come in, you know, all, you know, any money that you make off of copyrights, all those incomes can flow into the trust and the taxes of those can be deferred. Now, if the income isn't that much right now, you know, it's not something that you have to worry about. But again, if you're if you're getting to the point where you're making, you know, several hundreds of thousands of dollars. You're going to eventually, on a personal level, you're going to hit that 30%, 37% ceiling, and you're going to be paying a lot of taxes. 
And then you got the state taxes too that you have to deal with. Again, ways to fund the trust, you know, you know, rental real estate. You know, income from the from the business. You know, there's no capital gains tax that you that that's paid on any sell of any asset within the trust. And these are just the code sections. There's no limit to the amount of money that can be in these trust people, even though we have different strategies for um, individuals that have, you know, if you have assets, if you have assets of five million or more, we typically utilize an insurance wrap. We have a, a, another product that's called private placement life insurance that we utilize for, you know, um, people with higher net worth. Um, under five million, you know, can can safely be managed through this particular, you know, tax strategy, this trust. So it kind of just depends on where you are. Um, with your net, you know, net worth and wealth. There's, you know, there's something for everybody. But there's there's really no limit to the amount of assets that can be sold from the trust. There's no really amount of assets that can be put into the trust. Again, there's only two times, there's only two times when you pay taxes and that's when the trust ends. So don't let it in. And when the trust gives a distribution. So don't give a distribution. If you don't do those two things, you will not pay tax. If you do one of those two things, you will pay tax. So the goal is to keep the trust going as long as possible. And the goal is to expense the money out of the trust and not give a distribution. And we show you how to do those. We show you how to structure your transactions so you don't have to worry about paying taxes. When you sell your assets to the trust, the trust might not necessarily have money at the time, so the trust will give you a demand note. So now you've sold your assets to the trust, the trust owes you money. So you've sold your assets and you still get to control those assets. What a beautiful thing. And the trust owes you money. Any money that the trust owes you is going to be money that you can take out of the trust tax-free and it's not considered a distribution. It's an expense because the trust owes you. And that money that the trust owes you, that you take out, you can do anything that you want with that money. We are not here to replace any of your trusted advisors. You can still maintain your trusted advisors, but I will tell you this, we are not in the business of training your attorney or your CPA or your money manager, any of those people. If they knew these strategies, they would have they would have offered them to you. So the fact that they never offered them to you means that they don't know. And, you know, it takes several hundreds of thousands of dollars to get this information, to learn, to study, to take, you know, to, to get the information. Um, and it takes several years um to to learn the code sections um it takes several years to actually you know do these returns it takes years in order for people to you know mess things up where you have to you know defend them on the audit so there's a lot of you know trial and error and there's a lot there's a there's a lot of learning that comes with you know dealing you know in this sector and um you know we've been around long enough to see you know everything you know, that could possibly happen. You know, we've seen people, you know, get sued. You know, we've seen people, you know, the corporation might get audited, which will trigger an audit to the trust return. Because again, the trust return itself doesn't have an audit program. So the only way a trust can get audited, in the two audits that we did, one audit, there was 
wasn't my client, but somebody totally different, a total different uh, accountant. He, he wasn't confident and he asked the IRS for an audit. I mean, who does that? Who, who asks the IRS for an audit? Who does that? So this accountant, he asked for an audit. So the IRS gave him, the IRS gave him what he asked for. And so he got audited. And then, you know, he came to me with his, you know, tail between his legs, you know, I need help. Help me with this audit. And I represent the audit and I won. Um, there was another instance where um, the trust owned a corporation. The corporation got audited. And because the corporation got audited, it pulled the trust into an, an audit. But the trust, you know, again, we won the audit on the trust side. Um, but those are the only times that you would probably ever have to worry about an audit happening. Other than that, they just don't happen. Again, because the IRS doesn't have, you know, an audit program for trust returns. But again, you know, you know, a lot of attorneys, 99% of the attorneys out there, 99% of the CPAs out there, they don't have the credentials, they don't have the skill set. You know, the CPAs, they know the tax and accounting, but they don't know the trust law and they don't know contract law. The attorneys, they're going to know the trust law, maybe. They're going to know contract law, but they're not going to know the tax law. You know, and they not necessarily know the business side of it. So they don't have, you know, all of the all of the um, they don't have all of the, you know, different credentials and all the different skill sets in order to, to pull this together. But. I just happen to be a freak of nature because I love school. I love studying. Um, I love learning things new. I love solving problems. And this is what we do. A lot of times, you know, we, we save lives. You know, there was, a, there was a client that was getting sued and she was going to, you know, get a divorce because of a lawsuit. I was like, no, you know, stay together. I'm going to make the lawsuit go away. And I made the lawsuit go away and a couple stayed together. There was a... Uh, there was, an, there was an attorney that was a client of mine and he was thinking about committing suicide. I said, no, don't commit suicide. We can sell a, you know, we can sell your tax debt for pennies on a dollar. So, so I love what I do. I love saving lives. I, I love changing lives. I love changing the trajectory of people's financial futures and the futures of their families. Um, because again, the, the most patriotic thing that you can do is to keep more of your tax dollars in your pocket. Because again, you know, I basically explained to you, your tax dollars aren't really going to help the government anyway. <laughs> your tax dollars are going back to these huge corporations in the forms of refunds. And so, you know, we don't want to do that. We want to, we, we don't want to be taking Jeff Bezos out for lunch and paying, you know, picking up the tab. You know, if anything, we want him to pick up the tab. Um, but, that pretty much ends the presentation. And, you know, people a lot of times will ask about, well, what if these laws change? They're not gonna change. These laws are written by them for them. And never be deceived that the rich will permit you to vote away their wealth. They won't. There's always going to be tax shelters. There's always going to be golden nuggets in the tax code, you know, for, for, wealthy, for wealthy people to avoid taxes. And again, if, we, if we're looking at the definition of wealthy, we're just we're saying people that are non W-2 It's not meant for, you know, it's not meant for the working class. It's meant for business owners. It's meant for owners, people that own things, owners, you know, business owners, um, people that don't have to necessarily work. You know, the tax code is made for them. So at this time, I'm going to open up you know, open up for questions. I know we went over um, um, by 13 minutes and we still haven't gotten to all the questions, but this is such an important topic and it's very, very hard to um, really get through all of it in such a small period of time. Hey, uh, Matthew, uh, whew, man, I knew it was going to be serious. And um, yeah, this, this is information, information, knowledge. Definitely, it, it can change everything. So we appreciate you dropping these nuggets. Um, and so we will do some Q&A, but I do want to let everyone know, uh, you know, so you may have to leave and, and we, we understand that. 
Uh, I put in the chat a couple of times that uh, the the replay uh, would be available on on uh, our Facebook and and YouTube. Um, so if you have to leave, but we will continue say as long as Matthew is available and and you know folks have questions. So at some point, obviously that will end. But um, let's 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 get into it. And uh, for someone who well, well, first of all, Matthew, have you put your contact information uh, and made that available on screen? Because I know folks were asking for it earlier. Yeah, let me let me put that in. Um, Go back to that slide, or yeah. Um, I'll put it in my IG. Yeah, uh, and, and, and so that was in circulation a little bit earlier as well. And I hope everybody has already seen it. I'm look. I'm scrolling up a cup a few messages, and I see. Uh, LinkedIn. Um, Thank you, Jesse. I'm on LinkedIn. I don't necessarily know how to, but you just search me on LinkedIn. <laughs> right, uh, right. Okay. Uh, put my phone number in here. Uh, email as well. Hey, so we so we like to do the questions of verbally. <laughs> yeah, let's just do that because um, you know, um, I mean, I guess I can kind of go through the chat. But I think it'd be more expeditious if people just uh, unmute themselves and just ask me one on one, you know. Right. So, uh, so, so who who is going first? If you could, I see. I Rosalind. will. I will. I'm Gina Robinson, and I'm okay. in Maryland. I'm in okay. Maryland. Um, one, mm -hmm. I can't see the contact information, but two, um, is this specific to people in Atlanta? Or is your information, um, are you able to practice or do this in any state? I practice in all, you know, with this particular trust, I practice in all 50 states. Perfect. Internationally, I practice in 111 countries. Um, we have uh, insurance wraps that we do in 111 countries. Um, so I am an international tax attorney and celebrity, uh, celebrity tax strategist. So, um, yeah, you know. Tax advantages are available to you, young lady. Outstanding. But if somebody could put your contact information in the chat, that would be yeah, great. Yeah, it's in the, it's in the chat. It. I put yeah, my yeah. IG, um, uh, LinkedIn, no, email. Um, I don't see it. Wow. When, did he, when did he put? Uh, I don't see it. Oh, oh, oh I'm sorry. Did you, I, did, you, I did it direct. I'm sorry. Yeah, he put it, it direct. It. Right. But, it, but it was also so, in there. Okay, and I see a uh, Rosalind. Are you there? You have you have a raised hand. Yes. Hey, hey, hey. Can you hear me? Yes. yes. Okay. Um, hello, Matthew. Thank you so much. Really great information. Um, I also um, actually provide financial literacy information to clients. So these this is so important. My first question to you is: um, At what point do you recommend people establish a trust? And what I mean by that is as you are developing your business or do you say, okay, wait to a certain, you know, till you've received a certain amount of profit before you establish that trust? Um, you should establish a trust the minute you, you know, own anything of significant wealth. You know, if you, if you own a home outright, uh, if you own a business outright, you know, any of those things that, you know, if I were to put a dollar figure on it, I would say, you know, a few, you know, $100,000, I would say, would be the time. Okay, awesome. And, and then you also mentioned something about a uh, life insurance product that you uh, recommend for clients, I'm assuming that has um, maybe a, a larger amount of assets. Is that right? Um, well, yeah, private placement life insurance isn't a regular insurance product. It's not, it's not an insurance product where you pay premiums every month and you get a life benefit. The private placement life insurance, your, your assets are your premiums. And then we tack pure insurance on it. So let's say, for example, if you have 5 million in income producing assets, you would have the five million plus we would put 20 million in life insurance. So that would be a $25 million policy and that 25 million would pay out upon your death. So they would get all of the assets plus your life insurance. The only thing that makes it life insurance is the life insurance component. 
Otherwise, it's basically a tax shelter. And yeah. you know, it's, it's, it's available only to um, qualified purchasers. So you would have you have to have a net worth of a, at least five million. Gotcha. And how do you keep a trust going? You mentioned that. How do you keep a trust going? You keep a trust going by by appointing successors. And that successor can be a friend. It can be a family member. You know, a son, a daughter, you know, good friend, they keep it going. You know, they take over once you pass and then they appoint someone to take over, you know, when they pass. And it just keeps going on and on and on. Gotcha. Thank you. Use the raise hand. You all know how to use the uh, raise hand. Please raise your hand via Zoom. And so we can call on you if you have a question. And that is going to be in the reactions, right? Is that G? Is that Gina? It's Gina. Gina. It's Gina. Gina. Thank you, Gina. Go ahead. Gina, be, be, before you, before, before you, before you go, I did promise Keila that you know this this trust product is a thirty five thousand dollar product. Um, I told Keila since we went way back that I'll basically, if individuals covered the cost of production, that we would do it. The cost of production is $2,000. So if you contact me today, um, today only, because people come to me five years later and say, can I still get that trust for $2,000? Uh, no. <laughs> um, we're going to offer that for today, um, $2,000. And, and you contact me. Again, this is a $35,000 product that we're offering to the members, everybody that's watching today, 2000 for today only. Um, you can contact me any way that you want. Text me, send me an email, you know, direct message, LinkedIn or IG, however you contact me. But this is a once in a lifetime opportunity um, to get this product. I mean, you can't even get, you can't even get a living trust for that amount of money. I mean, it is basically, you know, basically just paying for the production and, you know, basically paying for the, you know, for our clerical staff to basically process the trust. Um, there's no profit in there. And that's my way of giving back um, to everyone that attended. And so all of you guys can start off, you know, on the right foot. Yeah. yeah. And I, but I go ahead with your question. I just wanted to, I just wanted to make that. Uh, yeah, it's a great announcement. Good make that commercial real quick. <laughs> and so we can okay. get back to the questions. Okay, so to you, I wanted to say this. Uh, I too am in the financial services area, but nothing like what you're doing. But this is in reference to the index universal life as well as fixed index annuities. Um, what's your take on those? Um, <clears throat> I don't like anything that's gonna be subject to tax. Annuities are gonna be subject to tax at one point in time. Um, <laughs> Again, these are these are basically these are basically tax shelters. So okay, you don't, so oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. You don't want to you don't want to take something that is you know you know you know getting rid of tax and then enter the tax again. I know okay, that so, no. Go mm -hmm. ahead. I'm sorry. No, the IULs are tax free. Yeah, the IULs. And the then, insurance is tax free yeah, upon death. The death benefits and the loans as well. Yes. No. Well, they have it where it's not a death benefit, actually. But that's a whole nother thing. It's just a building wealth or what have you on that. So you living benefits come with that. But the fixed index one, that's where it's also supposedly tax free. Your money gain, you never lose your money. Yeah. But what we're talking about, we're talking about things that normally would be taxable. You know, and that's why the, the, the private placement, that's why we use the insurance code to turn a, a, what would normally be a tax shelter, we would turn it into an insurance policy because insurance is one of the only things in the tax code that is exempt from taxes. So Absolutely. that's why we Absolutely. use that. But again, remember, with the private placement life insurance policy, your assets are your premiums. Got it. It's, it's, it's a paid and for premium. You don't pay like, you know, a hundred bucks a month or, you know, a thousand bucks a month. Your rental real estate, is your premium. It's a one-time payment when you put your premium, when you put your assets into that insurance wrap. But again, there's, you know, for those of you, um, for those of you that's interested in that and want to know more, 
Um, I have a best-selling book on Amazon. Um, it's available. Protect. I'm going to put the title in there. Protect Your Wealth with PPLI. It's a bestseller on Amazon. You guys can pick that up. Um, okay. And it explains the PPLI. And so we, if we, we want to keep it moving, thank you, uh, uh, Gina, for, for attending and your question. I, I see, is that Jules? Yes. Hi, how are you? It's been a minute. <laughs> <laughs> I know. I I, I got to get more more active. It's, oh, it's just good to see you. That's no problem. No problem. All right. Um, I missed the first part of this because I had another Zoom event going on, um, and I have a, a a big network that's just over the, all over the United States. But anyway, um, I have two questions. The first one is: Does a trust have to be incorporated? Should it be? Again, a, a, a trust isn't a corporate. It's not a statutory entity. It's a contract. Okay. So Which no, it's not. In, it's not incorporated. It's not registered anywhere. Okay, but it, it owns. It can own the LLC that you create. Yeah, it can own the majority of it because you're going to want to. You, you're going to want to claim some income for yourself. Okay. So I, I read somewhere uh, on something that there's a new law coming out about LLCs, I think it's in January. Um, are you familiar with what that is as to why the trust ownership was suggested? Um, that new law, and I'm familiar with it, but it's, you know, it's, um, it's another, you know, another subject area that I wanna really get into, but it won't affect the trust ability uh, as far as ownership. Okay, that's it for me. Thank you. Awesome. Um, I only got a little of it, but I, 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 it was valuable, and I, I appreciate you. You definitely want to. You definitely want to review the recording because this is this is once in a lifetime information. Oh, I plan to. I, I get plan it. To. Okay. I, I do nonprofit and uh, business development, just helping people set up um, and get established. And a lot of people ask me different questions, so now I have a source to refer to. Okay. Okay. Right. Okay, everybody, it's 1226. Uh, you know, let's get these questions in. Yeah, I mean, hey, Mr. Matthew's making himself available until he says, Hey, I'm done. Uh, yeah, you definitely don't want to, you definitely don't want to because I bill at three thousand dollars an hour, so you definitely want to get this information, right. you know, as soon as possible, as much as you can. And I'm sending it to you know, I'm here, you know, until the to, until the last question with uh, okay. within reason. Okay, raised hand anywhere? All right, no, it's not a problem. I mean, that was a lot of information. I know y'all are processing and probably got to go back and watch that replay, all of that, but- uh, Yeah, that's a lot. We covered a lot. We covered a lot. Um, it's, it's basically, you know, your, yeah. your financial future passing before your eyes. So it's not something that you want to take lightly. You want to, you know, Watch it a few times and let it sink in. Okay. All right. And so I do want to acknowledge uh, uh, Keila Taylor. Uh, she's the chair of our governmental affairs committee, but you know, it was she she introduced uh, Matthew, uh, brought him to the table. So we appreciate that. And then that happens a lot with the chamber, and many of you know, you know, somebody has a, a great connect and uh and they're like, hey, you know, we we could benefit somehow. And so Thank you, Ms. Taylor. Um, hey, before we close out, you know, this is Men's Month and uh, we're having this Men's Month Awards luncheon on the 28th, but two weeks from today. Uh, so if anybody wants a, a, a discount promo code, we'll be, so we'll be downtown, 11 a.m. It's a luncheon. Ventana's is the venue. If anybody wants that promo code, uh, email info at atlantablackchambers.org, info at atlantablackchambers.org. I'm gonna put it in the chat and give you a nice discount uh, to come out and join us for that as I am looking to sell that thing out, okay? But I appreciate all of you showing up. Again, this is the stuff that when you show up, that's confirmation that you understand, hey, this is, this is real, I need this and that's what we got to do, make this stuff available for you and you come through. So uh, 50 plus attendees, <laughs> that's solid. We'll take that.
<laughs> Matthew, you got any, any anything you want to say to a man before? Hey, brother, thank you so much. I just want to make sure you know that I appreciate you coming to the ABC. You are welcome. Like I said, you know, we we have to we have to get back, you know. Um, and uh, people are like, oh, I met that guy before. He spoke to us before. Um, I like to tell people I'm the Johnny Cochran of tax. People just don't know me yet, but they might. Well, I have hey, a client right now that is uh, he's um, he's about to go through a case. The, um, the same attorney that represented Johnny Depp and the Johnny Depp and Amber Heard case is representing him. And um, I'm representing his trust. And this the the the, the person is seeking to get money from him. And it's going to be very it's going to be very fun telling them to go kick rocks because they can't get anything from this particular trust. So I'm well, we, excited about that development. We definitely. Uh, we definitely see you. You like you like to win. <laughs> I, I love to win. That's the Marine in me. Like, I don't like losing. I am a bulldog and people need a bulldog when, when they have, you know, they're being represented. They need a bulldog. They don't need someone that's going to lay down and give up. I got you. OK. All right. Well, hey, everyone, uh, thank you so much uh, for coming out with this. And, uh, you know, we, we do these things periodically. So appreciate you. Appreciate you coming through. All right. Thank you, guys. Thanks for having me.